Okay, hi everybody. Welcome. It's noon on Wednesday, a little bit past noon on Wednesday on the East Coast. I'm Brad Rath, the head of school of One Schoolhouse, and I am joined uh, by my friend Travis Brownlee, the head of school at Marin Academy. Hey, Travis. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. I hope not good evening for anybody, but it's great to be here, Brad. Travis, I am so excited to talk about this topic with you, working through challenging situations. Um, at, before we get going, I just want to remind folks quickly um, that we have a few things uh, up on our blog right now. You'll see a blog post from me. We've called Conquering Whack-A-Mole, uh, the old arcade game where moles pop up and you have to hit them on the head. That's kind of how we think about August in independent schools. Um, next week, we'll be talking about the difference between decision making and problem solving in our webinar and focusing on that topic. If folks uh, uh, um, have any needs for student courses, please make sure to get in touch with us ASAP. A number of our courses are starting to fill up and we want to make sure that we can um, uh, handle any needs that might arise for your school. Uh, and this week, we asked in our Pulse survey, what are the top three challenges that are top of mind for you right now as academic leaders? And you noted, rightly and importantly, health and safety, mental health and wellness, scheduling, sectioning, staffing, student issues. Some of these are more top of mind than, uh, than for others these days. I see like that scheduling really popping for a number, or staffing, excuse me, popping for a lot of different folks. Travis, before we get into our conversation, any thoughts on what you're seeing here? Yes, definitely. Well, I think um, particularly coming off of the last 18 months and with the Delta variant added in, um, there is necessarily going to be some real concern about that, not only for those of us who are school leaders and who need to make sure we create a safe environment that um, allows us to teach in, in the ways that we value, but also with our family communities. And <clears throat> so I think that, you know, we learned a lot last year and we need to remember that. Uh, mm -hmm. There will be, you know, I, I don't know about many of you, but I'm just now coming off my vacation and, um, it was a nice way to step away from the immediacy and uncertainty that seemed to weave through every minute of last year. But it's also important to remember that we know a lot more than we did. And um, we have exercised muscles we didn't know we had. And um, there's always gonna be a, a lot of frothing around there and some uncertainty because there are things that we don't know. But we know how to figure out what we don't know even better now than we did 18 months ago. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Travis. And so let's, let's dive into this because sure. um, I, I think that there are some, some things that we want to think about even before we get into like, what have we learned out of COVID, including just academic leaders at this time of year have to make, it seems like a decision every hour. Like somebody has come to you with a new challenge and help me solve this. And I need you to solve this yesterday type thing. Right. <laughs> what, what types of frameworks do you use and have you used throughout uh, your career to help guide you in that decision-making process? Right. Well, I am, um, and that's, that is a great question. And I'll say, I'll give my answer. And there are different answers for different heads and leaders. I, I know that there are associate heads, assistant heads, deans, department chairs potentially here. And so we don't all have the same answer. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm coming here with a silver bullet that's gonna solve every problem. But here's what I will say, and I think it's an important framework to remember, is that when someone comes in and says, do you have a minute, which is frankly never a minute, um, <laughs> or, or I have this problem, I need you to solve it. What we as leaders need to do is to have the discipline to help gently move that back in their direction. Mm -hmm. Because our problem solving of today um, is the result positive and potentially negative of things that we have done in the past several years. So at MA, we take a very team approach. Um, mm -hmm. Although obviously as head of school, um, I am often the one who's making a, a final decision, but my process is around building teamwork and strong, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we don't have assistant heads, but I have, I have three deans and two directors um, who report directly to me and then a very strong administrative structure of other directors and athletic directors and directors of admissions. And so to me, it's about remembering in these moments that we don't have to go it alone as heads of school. We yeah. are we have hopefully surrounded ourselves with really competent people that we can consult with. 
I, and I, doesn't that hold true for so many academic leaders within our schools? We all have teams that are supporting it, whether us, whether it's a department chair and a team of teachers that are working together on that, or a division director and uh, the class deans that are working together on right. a problem like that. Thinking about that team approach and trying to build that so that it can be successful over a long term period is really the goal there. Absolutely. And I, you know what I'll say? I mean, people come to headship into their leadership in different ways. For me, I'm proud of having spent the first 15 years of my career as a teacher, where all of us as teachers are a little bit of lone wolves, right? We like yep. the autonomy yep. of our classroom. As leaders, we need to remember that that's not a paradigm that really works, nor does yep. it engage all your resources. Travis, one of the things you've said to me, too, is that helps you in the kind of first pass at any challenge that comes your way is to make sure that the first question you ask is what's best for kids. Right. So, so for us, as we, you know, and this is definitely will feel abstract, but I think it's an important um, thing to always stand on. So we are schools and whether we are pre-K or nursery through 12 or nine twelves, whatever our configurations are as schools, and whatever our roles are in schools. And this runs from people that work in buildings and grounds and advancement you know, to your rock star math and English and science teachers, is that our job is to educate kids from what's best for them in the context of our mission statements of our schools. That's what makes us independent schools. Yep. And in the framework of our strategic plans. Those are, are things that, 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 that roll off my tongue all the time. Those are important um, focus points, and they help provide really useful guardrails. And um, you know, at MA, we are definitely the both and school um, in many respects. And one of the things that I think is important is when you have pretty clear guidelines, when you need to change and uh, go in a different direction or be flexible, it's helpful to have them because it makes you think clearly and fully about why am I changing our pattern? So to me, those are the things that really matter, starting with what's best for kids in the context of our own mission statements and supported by our strategic plans. So Travis, I'm gonna pause here for one second and let folks know that are attending today's webinar live to go ahead and put some of the things, that, some of the questions that you asked to guide decision-making into the chat um, so that Travis and I can see them. And then also, if you have additional questions as we go along for Travis, please don't hesitate then to, uh, to put them in the Q&A area. We use Q&A at One Schoolhouse um, for all questions and to keep track of those. While we're waiting for some questions to come in, Travis, um, I, I wanna ask you about what happens when you have to make a decision that the entire team doesn't agree with. <clears throat> you know, There are times, of course, even if we're using the same questions to frame our work, that we're gonna come down on different sides of things. How do you help make sure that that team has great trust in the decision-making process, even when they don't always agree with the decision that's being made. That's, that, that, is, that is the key to our leadership in independent schools because we tend to be, um, even though we are businesses, we don't actually act that way. And that's right. a good thing. Um, but this is, this is how I think about it. So first of all, you have to have developed that strong leadership team where you create an atmosphere in which people can disagree and disagree with you as the leader, whether you're the department chair and it's your department or whether it's the head of school and it's your entire employee base or your leadership team. And yep. we learned this last year, we have to have courage to look at all aspects of things. And this is the reason why heads of school need to be 3,000 thousand feet, 5,000 feet above the daily work. Um, yeah. you know, if, I, if I am myself in the weeds making every single decision about, you know, um, uh, whether we're going to use this testing co company or that testing company, you know, that's not, that's, that's not where my head should be. But as a general rule, I think that teamwork is important. You got to be clear about who's making the decision, really encourage lively debate, like you know, you never shame people for taking a different position. I mean, as heads of school, we sometimes have to really be careful about, you know, thinking that we have the best idea, right? Or right. That, that, you know, like I'm gonna get defensive because they're not taking my position. I think when you do that and then you explain your decisions, then that's a healthy team. And we learned this last year because mm. it was not possible to please anybody. And this is a muscle that got exercised 
in such visible ways, so publicly amongst every constituency, including you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago <laughs> Tribune, and the LA Times. So we know how to do this. It doesn't make it necessarily simpler or easier, but we should have more confidence and more courage about walking into that. I'll say one more thing. One yeah. thing that I think really develops that trust is having what we at MA call a transdisciplinary approach. Mm. Yeah, talk more about that. That's, yeah. yeah. So we all bring different ways of thinking. Um, they're all, all different ways, whether you do Myers-Briggs or Firo B or whatever, there are lots of things to do, uh, the Enneagrams. But people come at these from different perspectives and it's important to understand how they think about things and to wrap that into how you're doing it. But what's also important is you have to bring the key people to the table. I mm -hmm. never make any decisions in isolation unless there is an emergency and someone's bleeding to death and it has to happen now. And so far that actually hasn't happened at my school where anyone's bleeding to death. So there's a lot of reason, you know, to be able to take a pause and say, let's think this through. Yeah, that's interesting. That's one of the things that, that my team did is we expanded um, last year in order to meet the needs of schools. We grew our administrative team out a lot and the team took some time during a retreat last winter to uh, do the Gallup Strengths Finder assessment, um, which you know we loved because it's talking about things from such a point of bring your strengths to the table and the decisions. Don't worry about the you know anything that's not a particular strength for you. Show up with those strengths because those strengths are going to be important for us to make uh, the right decisions as a team. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, people participate in different ways. We know that as teachers, we should not unlearn that knowledge uh, as leaders of schools either. So one thing you also mentioned there that I'd like to kind of circle back to for a second, because I think it's important for the audience that is often with us during these webinars. Um, during these webinars, they're, they're geared towards the academic leadership at schools. And sometimes I know academic leaders can get frustrated that the heads operating at the 30,000 foot view rather than in the, what is this assessment going to be or what's happening to the math curriculum type view, right? Why is that so important that the whole team is on the same page on that? And, and how can an academic leader work with the head effectively knowing that that head's at that 30,000 foot view? Well, again, I think it starts with what is something that I said earlier. Number one, what's best for kids in the context of your mission and strategic plan. Now, that may seem like a very broad stroke for deciding on your math curriculum, but they're actually very connected. So that's that's the key. Those are some of the key questions that heads need to ask. Um, you know, I'm an English teacher. I, you know, I don't get engaged with what I think the curriculum should be in English. That's right. not my job. My job is to ask some of those questions, however. And then I think one of the reasons why, how it's important for the academic leaders there and working with the team is frankly, some of it is learning how to manage up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I when I have a, you know, a when when I am talking with a dean and this is a conversation we've had over time, like let's say it's about using folio that we began with a few years ago and we're returning to. This is a this is a conversation that we keep having and we are the kind of relationship where I say, I don't know if that sounds so right. Or, you know, my dean of faculty can say, well, actually, I don't think that sounds so right. We've got to move in this direction. And so with that mutual respect focused on what's best for kids really helps. And the other thing is you have to remember as an academic leader, whether you're an academic dean, a dean of faculty or a department chair, in the end, I am presenting this all the time. I could yep. be at the farmer's market and I have, you know, a parent say like, well, you know, actually this happens to me, but, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, but for a range of things, academics to, you know, could you please tell kids not to wear their cell phones on their body because it's dangerous for them? You know, I, you know, I could say, hey, I'm at the farmer's market, call me on Monday, but that's not the atmosphere we've developed. So I think, if people understand that we are all engaged in being able to talk about these things, that's another reason. I want to be able to know exactly why we're doing what we're doing. Right, right. No, that's, sometimes that's great. Heads, sometimes heads have to explain how they learn. You know, I, I have a leadership team that's 50% introverts. I am the opposite of an introvert, which is an extrovert. And I process out loud. So when I'm working with people for the first time, I talk about how I work. And then we figure out how we'll work together. 
that's that is that is super important, right? Like that's that's a huge nugget to take away, is having that conversation about how to effectively work together. Um, so Travis, let's now circle back to uh, something you also said earlier, and that is that schools are much better positioned today, and academic leaders are much better positioned today to enact change in their schools because they've had to throughout the pandemic, right? What right. used to take years now takes days. Um, in part because we realize that we can evolve much we, that we can evolve rather than having to have all the answers right at the beginning and right up front. Right. So here's what here's what I think about that is that is that we should remember, you know, particularly if we have ever been teachers, is that we don't expect kids to understand the entire curriculum on the first day because otherwise none of us would have work. Um, <laughs> you know, that is true. And so this notion of perfectionism and having the answers, which I understand a lot of people want answers from you. It is, it is, it is a false path. You know, the only people I want to have, have perfection is the guy that replaced both my knees. I really want him to get that right. Right. But in mm -hmm. a school, schools are messy. Learning's messy. And this is what our parents learned, right? When they watched a lot of <laughs> online learning is it, it is messy. So to me, it's about excellence and excellence is about engaging in those questions, um, trying to do better and not getting stuck in the past. We know we can do this. Now, nobody wants to do this. And, and this is where I have to appreciate one schoolhouse a great deal as a head of school. Um, there's a presentation that, that was given um, that, that talked about how we actually do have a map about this. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the second was the one on um, the seminar that was done last summer around uh, how we need to respond differently to kids from a socio-emotional perspective. I mean, yes. I, had, I had deans watch that and it very much imbued how we manage students. So one schoolhouse is on top of this, like nobody's business. And, and I really appreciate that. And, but for me, I also think that as we, we go forward in this year, we don't want to do this under an emergency, but we need yes. to step away from that old paradigm of, hey, it takes a lot to change. And if it ain't broke, why change it? Because we always have to evolve. And sometimes I worry that um, people's resistance to that change is just a polite way of saying, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it, because that's how I want to do it. And that's where you know, it is a great thing to have autonomy as a teacher and as a leader. And it also has its dangerous edge as well. And that's what we always have to be aware of is that both and as we look at our leadership and our decision making. That's that's super, that's super important, Travis. I, I couldn't agree with you more that if we can get rid of the perfectionist tendencies of independent schools at the end of this pandemic, we're going to be in better shape. We've gotten a question in too now. Uh, this question is, uh, how do you as a head decide on the right or excuse me, the just right amount of communication for an individual issue? Uh, too much for one constituent is not enough for another. Um, we can never seem to you know, communicate enough, though, these days, too. How, how do you handle communication around change? Right. So I, I don't have a again, I don't I don't have a. I don't have a, um, a silver bullet for this one. I am dying for someone to tell me I have communicated too much. So I don't know <laughs> who's out there listening, but you know, I, it feels like you know it's impossible to feed the beast of I need more information. And I think I did get a comment last year, which is, would you please stop talking to us about science for a while? And I thought, <laughs> well, no, actually, I'm not going to stop talking to you about science. Here's what I think. And this is something I have learned, and I learned it more last year. Um, and again, there are lessons that we all relearn in our lives, is that sometimes communication should be, you know what? We don't have a lot to communicate that's changed. Here are the ongoing issues we're exploring, and we're going to get to them as soon as we can. Mm. You know? And so sometimes it is about that kind of thing, because that's, you know, again, our constituencies are filled with people that manage information differently, that um, have different personalities and different characteristics. So how do I decide just the right amount? So first of all, I let go of just the right amount. I don't even think about it that way, to be honest. Um, I think about it from, from several, there's sort of uh, a decision tree that I go at. One, um, 
you know, there's a lot of information today about COVID. I shared that we share all the information. We just mm -hmm. send it out. I don't think anybody's reading it anymore, frankly. But every time we get the notifications from Marin County Health, we just send it to everybody. We send yep. it to the faculty. We send it to the students. We send it to, you know, our, our other people. I mean, I think we've now gotten it into like a once every two weeks communication. That's one thing. The second thing is, is it is this notion about wanting in some ways every decision that we make we have to build um, a thesis and an argument for and so i see communication as a way of building that thesis um, and letting people understand what our thinking is now there are also sensitive things and again i don't know if the question is also coming um, from from this position is that there are also things that we just can't talk about and we have to have multiple sentences that go like this. I'm sorry, we just can't talk about that. It's not our practice to talk about personnel matters, blah, 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 all of that sort of thing. And that's important. But I think that I would get rid of just right. I wouldn't even think about it that way. I think the other thing is, is that we all have to decide what's our bandwidth. I mean, we have different yeah. numbers of people working in our communications offices and some of us don't even have communications offices. Right, right. So, yeah. And you brought up you brought up something that I, I want to actually tie back to your farmers market example a second ago. Um, you sure. brought up something that a, a head of school once said to me: that, uh, a holding statement in communications is the head's best friend, um, which is almost the same as like in the farmers market saying, you know, I just don't really know about that, but I can get back to you on Tuesday with a really good answer, right? Like the holding statement, the idea of pushing pause and telling people that you're pushing pause buys you the time um, and, and also confidence to let your community and constituents know that you're taking care with the question, you understand that there is a concern out there, you understand that there needs to be an answer to the questions that are being posed, but it's not gonna be something that comes at you tomorrow. It's not gonna be an answer that comes to you tomorrow. And a lot of academic leaders feel often like they have to answer that question in the moment Right. And a big takeaway from this is, no, you use the holding statement, like give yourself some time to think Absolutely. through, particularly a thorny situation. Absolutely. And I, I, I like to say to people, I want to be able to give you my full attention. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think I think this holding statement, Brad, is 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 a really key. And and I guess what I will also add to that is that um, people who come at you like that, they are being driven by some emotion, fear, or worry. Yeah. And our job yeah. as a leader is to hold that space, but not always react to that space because nobody wants a leader who makes a decision here and then has to make a decision here and has to make a decision here. I mean, many of us finally, and it took a while, found the sweet spot in the last 18 months of when we had to change our minds and mm -hmm. how we communicated that. Uh, we yeah, and we watched school leaders. I think from our perspective, looking at all these schools and their statements that were coming out on COVID, we we watched everybody change from like we're making a statement every day to we're making a statement every week to okay we're making some changes now every two weeks or month or three months. That time period extended out pretty quickly, and you could see the wheels turning and better decision making happening as as folks bought themselves some time to right to get there. Right. And of course, you know, we were also like our students. We got better over time because we learned. Yes. We applied. And I'll also say about communication is I, as an individual, I'll speak for me. I can't possibly hold and know and read every blog post, every this, every that, right. every piece of information. That's why you have a team. And that's why you right. need to have a team, you know, who has really deep skills. And you have to let them know you want to hear what they have to say. Yep, and you need your team really connected to all the different constituent groups within so that when you do have to make that decision from the 30,000 foot view, um, you have all the all the data points or as many data points as you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, Travis, this has been a super fun conversation. Don't be surprised if we kind of knock on your door and ask you to come back for a future session. I love um, I love One Schoolhouse. What terrific work is happening here. Well, thank you. Very sweet to say that. And uh, and we, of course, love all the folks at Marin Academy and uh, and are excited to continue our work together. Thank you, everybody, thank you. for joining us today. Me as well. Me as well. Take care, everybody. Good luck with the opening of school. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.